All right, welcome everyone. Today we're going to be talking about the short path or the happy path to implementing Einstein product rec recommendations on the, the Commerce Cloud. A little bit about myself. My name is Ross Guthrie. I'm an industry strategist with the Commerce Cloud. Uh, I've been with the company for about four years. And I spend most of my time bridging the gap that sometimes exists between the business and the technology. And it keeps me pretty busy. I'm sure you've heard enough about this today. A um, little bit of the agenda, we'll first start with a high-level look at architecture and some of the data points involved, uh, look at the process, and then actually go through a case study with one of our clients, Black Diamond. First, a quick introduction. What is Commerce Cloud? Uh, we are started as an enterprise e-commerce platform. We now offer in-store MPO, mobile POS point of sale technology as well as store operations and also post-sale uh, management applications. Uh, a couple stats, some stats from 2016. So 16 billion online and eight and a half billion in store purchases transacted through the system. And these are some of our clients. So what is a brief history on what Einstein is on the Commerce Cloud? Back when we were demandware, we purchased a small boutique intelligence firm from Cambridge, Massachusetts with a bunch of smart fellows from MIT and Columbia and what have you and the like. And uh, we purchased them, I think, in 2014. And then by way of acquisition of Salesforce, C Quotient became Einstein on the Commerce Cloud in relation to Salesforce. So just a little context as to what, what we're talking about. So now into the architecture. This is what we would consider kind of a, a basic e-com platform architecture. We ha over on the right, we have our, those little orbs, our, our IDE, um, an integrated development environment where your developers will work. They'll push it to maybe a sandbox of their own or some shared sandboxes. You have a code repository if our clients use that, a build server if that's something they use to do regression testing and other things like that. And then they'll push the code to staging. And then they'll, they'll push the code to production and development. So this is a typical architecture. And then in the context of Einstein, we have the engine that's built on AWS architecture. And there's a various of data processing that happens and prepares the um, various inputs for processing through our models. And we get that data from out of the box feed generation or feed configuration modules from production. Uh, we have clickstream data, or activity tracking, as we'll also call it, which is uh, constantly running. It's automatically live. There's no events or anything that you guys have to code. It does depend on some attribution in the syntax. But other than that, um, there's nothing explicit that you have to do to get that part up and running. And then at the top there, we also do support offline or um, other channel order information. So either you have stores or maybe marketplaces is a common example. And then this is how we get it into the shopper experience. There is uh, a couple of admin applications on the left here, which are we call the configurator, which is for configuring the business logic for the recommendations, and then the business manager, which is uh, the merchant admin tool. And there's also some dynamic URLs that are generated if uh, predictive email is something that one of our clients are using. The process is pretty straightforward. Everything in orange is um, stuff that you or the client is enabled to do. So we always want to start with strategy and requirements. What is your goal? What are you trying to do? And what are your business's requirements? Next is data enablement. It's just a basically a flip of the switch. Then our part is to deploy the engine. We do a couple checks on the data, uh, make sure that the necessary pieces are there. Then we literally click a button to start the deploy process to initiate that first um, sort of training of your data set. Then after that, you, you can start development. Technically, you can start the development before the engine has been deployed. Um, but there wouldn't be any recommendations to render, so it wouldn't be that much fun. So once you can go into development, it really just involves um, referencing our implementation that we did in our reference application, Site Genesis. And that template is usually ready to go. If you're close to that implementation, you really don't have to make any changes. You drop a few one-line tags around the site, wherever you want to display recommendations, and you're ready to go. Um, and th then if you're new to the Commerce Cloud, we want to let the machine learning run for about 30 days before you actually deliver it so that we have uh, valid and quality recommendations to provide. 
you go into business manager, that's what the VM stands for, and you will basically schedule the slot or the content area, how long do you want it to run with this given logic, and then you can go live. And then there's at those last three between the go live and the machine learning, there's kind of a cyclical process because we're constantly learning and retraining every night and every week um, based on interaction with the recommendations and other products throughout your site, what people are buying, what pages they're viewing, and how they're behaving in general. A little bit about activity tracking or the clickstream tracking that I was talking about. On the right here, you have all the different events that we're tracking. They're fairly self-explanatory, so category views, checkouts, add to carts, whether they're look looking at recommendations and clicking them or not, viewing products. And we're constantly expanding the events that we are tracking to get a more full picture, um, especially with one of the new features we just released, predictive sort, which applies a similar scoring model to search results and category pages. Um, we're looking at search query terms and the product sets that result from those now. A um, little bit of performance. It's loaded asynchronously, asynchronously excuse me. Uh, it has no measurable I impact on load time and is injected from into the initial responses. So basically, it just follows the sequence. And that's the library if you want to go check it out. So into data enablement. This is the first step. You're going to want to set your region. There's only three regions. It's pretty straightforward. If you're in Asia, you're going to do APAC. If you're in Europe, you're going to do EMEA. If you're anywhere in the Western Hemisphere, you're going to set it to Americas. And if you want to track when customers are registering for new accounts and mapping their anonymous behavior prior to that point to an actual email address, marking that to yes will allow you to do that. Next, you'll set up the catalog feed. You'll define your host name. This helps us generate product URLs for some other apps that we're developing. Uh, the image view type as well supports the predictive email and these other apps. To, they're basically visual um, insights tools. And whether or not you want to include out-of-stock products, whether or not the site is multi-currency, and what your color attribute is, if there is any. You'll set a schedule. Uh, right now, the quickest we can run it is every day. We typically recommend doing it on a daily basis after you've completed what we call replication, which is like a transfer and publish into production. And that'll give us the most up-to-date information on what products are in stock and what you have available on the site. Next piece is the order feed. Even simpler, you set how many orders you want to run per day. Um, it really depends on your order volume. I've seen clients do as low as 1,000 and as many as 100,000 a day. Uh, so it's something that you'll have to gauge within your organization how far back in the history you want to get. So the export orders after is how far you want to go back. And we usually recommend about two years. It helps us understand seasonality of both the product and individuals. And whether or not you want to exclude email, um, it's really confusing backward logic. But exclude email, mean, no means yes, we want to include emails. And that's what allows us, again, that opportunity to map anonymous browse behavior up until the purchase to an identified individual when they make that purchase. And then this is where we come in. You'll submit a request with your customer success manager to basically my team, and they will deploy the engine. Granted, everything is in place. So let's talk a little bit about Black Diamond's journey th to, through implementing Einstein product recommendations. They implemented in three locations, no results page and the cart, and the PDP. They actually leveraged the same logic on the cart as they did in the no results page, so they were able to, you know, it was no, there was no extra work. They could use, set up, they set up one logic and it worked for both locations. They did a proof of concept. They were using an, a third party recommendations vendor at the time, and they wanted to test to know, make sure that we were at least as good so that our solution was free to them, so they wanted to make sure that it's as good so that there's still some profit story there. Um, they actually found out that it was not only as good, but quite a bit better. And, and they saw a 14% increase in average revenue per visit on the aggregate experience. So this is not specific to the recommendations, but this is the impact of including our recommendations, um, the impact on the entire shopping experience while including our recommendations. Um, again, they went in, turned on the feeds. They had no problems. They just went in, turned it on, scheduled it, and that was that. They used our out-of-the-box rendering template that I alluded to earlier. So all they had to do was place this one line of code 
on their product detail page, and they did you know one more line on their no results template and another line on their cart page. And I'll get into some more lessons learned around this later, but that was really the extent of it. The, one of the customizations they did do was making it a carousel. Our reference applic application just has four across, so they were able to quickly you know, animate it and provide a, a greater depth of product recommendations there. Just how easy it was to set it up. They, they didn't really configure any rules. All they did was add a third strategy to incorporate some kind of real-time component into the recommendations rather than looking at the aggregate view. So the real-time personalized, it starts to look at in-session and near-term session browse behavior and starts to base recommendations on what they're looking at, whether it's those exact products or folks that have looked at those products and ended up converting. So it'll start to float those up to the top as the session data gathers. Um, and besides that, they added one rule, I think, to exclude replacement parts, and that was it. So the rest of it was sort of these native strategies against their current or their previous third-party provider. This is the business manager component. Um, it's, we have a concept of content slots. They're basically dynamic content zones where you can segment different user groups, like mobile users or registered users. Um, and you can add different schedules. You can tie those to promotions if you're doing a promotion on the site that day. And we added a new type to support recommendations. And all you have to do is select your, what we call your recommender, which is that business logic that I showed you on the previous slide. Select the particular template you want to use. If one is um, you know, a carousel and another one is static, you'll have to decide at that point. You add a schedule, you click Apply, and make sure that your content is going to be captured in the next replication or that, that transfer and publish to the production environment. Um, they use the integra this integration validator is a Chrome plugin that our Einstein team developed to help uh, developers validate their implementation. So if there's any kind of error, it'll show red up there, and it'll tell you what's wrong. Um, it shows you you can just go on any Commerce Cloud site and use this and see what activities are being tracked on a given page, what kind of information we're tracking, and, and also which cookies that, um, that information is being logged to. The recommendations tab will show you uh, what, what recommendations or what logic is being displayed on the page so you can figure out you know, what you're working on. And then if you're using predictive email, it'll validate that your template is set up properly. So these are some best practices from Black Diamond. Um, they found that the f they sh you should try to float up similar or like products to the top of the rec or to the front, I guess, the left side of the recommendation zone. And then as, as you get further down, kind of push down more um, complementary products or those personalized products lower. Uh, cart and no results page that they wanted to prioritize personalize it, personalized recommendations. So they would actually put that as the primary strategy so that um, that was the first thing that kicked in. And always, a if you have an existing vendor, always A-B test against it so you know what kind of incremental benefit is there or not. And then afterwards, always test different recipes. So if you make absolutely any change to the business logic, test it against, test it against what you're currently doing to make sure that there is you know, that incremental benefit there. At Einstein, we kind of have this mantra where we want you to do less and achieve more. So start small. It's a crawl, walk, run approach. Start small and evol evolve from there. If you can achieve the same or better result with a lower effort, that's a win. And um, you know, we want you to enjoy use that time to do things that humans are better at, which is being creative and finding new avenues for acquisition, you know, uh, influencers, content, what, what have you. Some of their lessons learned, uh, the initial tech technical documentation was challenging. We heard that, and we, we adjusted very quickly, and I think they're happy with it now. Um, if you can, he, they recommend that you work with my team. And then for next steps, some things that they would like to see, better reporting, which is common. Uh, we have a pretty basic reporting set right now that are specific to the recommendations. Market basket features like predictive revenue projections. So if I add recommendations to this page, what are the potential benefits? Ability to alter recommendations and keep them within a category. I think this was just a knowledge gap on their part. This is available, and I've been since working with them to help achieve their use case here. And then the ability to adjust and test the algorithm. I think a lot of people have this. And the algorithm is constantly being adjusted and tested behind the scenes. But 
really playing with that configurator, the, the business logic tool that I, that I told you with is really the best way to kind of make sure you're getting the most out of, out of what the brain that sits behind the recommendations. Um, and then sticky products, being able to manually push one product into a zone if you have you know, high inventory or something along those lines. So these are, this is their wish list. And then some lessons learned that I've learned just from deploying four or 500 sites on the recommendations. Ensure the image view type is correct and contains the image URL. A lot of people just, I don't know, don't check. And then we, it ends up slowing down the whole process. Um, if you have external image delivery, like a scene seven or something along those lines, make sure that we know what the image URL pattern is so we can rebuild that and, and have the image URL available for the, for the model to, to use. And the product anchor or category anchor is not printed or is incorrect. So we ha all of our recommendations are contextual. So whatever product the shopper is on, we are recommending based on what other people have looked at, purchased, what that individual has looked at or purchased on the product they're on. So if they're on shirts, it's either going to be you know, anything but shirts or other shirts, depending on what you set up on the business logic. So we need to know the identity of that object that the, that the shopper is on. And if you look, I don't have a pointer, but there's a context object attribute there. And for whatever reason, that was either incorrect or not there at all. And so we had no context. And we weren't able to deliver recommendations. So that you know, slows things down a week or another sprint or something along those lines. And then um, category, same deal, except in the context of category recommendations. So if you're in men's, we're going to recommend from within the men's category. And then view recommendation, this is really important because it enables, it's one of those, those uh, syntax attributions that I was talking about that allows us to track certain events. And this one allows us to track view recommendations. That also allows us to stitch together the click of the recommendations and then ultimately attribute any sales or no sales that get um, attributed or that are from a product that was recommended in that zone. We have um, a community called Exchange, where it's kind of like my brain's dumping ground. I try to put as much as I learn on there as possible. And these are some great resources to use. The timeline is like a catch-all for everything. It goes through step by step and has all the rel uh, relevant documentation linked out from there for each step. Um, if you're new to Commerce Cloud, this whole process starts after you go live, because we could depend on real, real people, real time data in order to deploy the engine, so we need to be fully live in a, after the DNS switch has happened. The training guide here is a, is a soup to nuts technical documentation. It's like 35 pages, so you should be able to hand that to your developer, and they can run with it, hopefully, fingers crossed. And then Q&A, that kind of goes over some of the lessons learned, um, or sorry, QA, that goes over some of the lessons that I just covered in the last one, so just things to look out for when you guys are in implementation. Um, we have a couple features. Well, this one's available now. It was coming last time I gave this presentation. But it's, it applies the same logic to category grid pages and search pages. So it's available now. That whole process of enabling for product recommendations also enables basically any Einstein Commerce Cloud feature that we foresee coming out. There might be some exceptions. But for the next at least 18 months, that one deployment is going to support predictive sort recommendations, email. We have a Commerce Insights application, which is like basket intelligence, which I'm not going to get into here. And then automated dictionary settings. So this is for tuning your search results. And what it does is it looks at all of our sites, all of the search data across all sites, and we'll find uh, language commonalities that maybe don't exist in your product data. So maybe you have a lot of products that look orange, but in your data they actually are called tangerine. It'll discover that and suggest that you add that synonym in this place. And so the merchant, all they have to do is go, yes, I want it. No, I don't want it. In the, in the current state, or the, I guess, soon to be history state, they have to look at no search results pages. They have to analyze um, you know, which ones they need to prioritize, and then figure out what actually what synonyms to put in there. Well, this will look at um, you know, cross terminology and also cross language. So if you have a lot of Spanish and English shoppers on your site, it'll find those connections as well. So it's pretty cool. And that is, we're looking to, to do a beta at the end of this year for a release in Q1 of next year. That's it.
Any questions? No? Thank you.